Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction Company up in Pennsylvania, taking a look at one of the submachine guns that is going to be in their upcoming Extraordinary Firearms Auction. This is a Setme C2, also known as a CB64, submachine gun, and it is obviously heavily patterned after the Sterling submachine gun. However, it is absolutely not just a copy of the Sterling. In fact, none of the parts are interchangeable, and the C2 here actually has quite a few really interesting mechanical features to it. It's like they found some really bright people to do the design of this gun, with the exception of the guy who designed the stock, because the stock is kind of awful. So let's go ahead and take a look at the whole thing. All right, we're going to start with the elephant in the room here, which is the similarity to the Sterling submachine gun. So I have a standard pattern L2A3 Sterling up here, as well as the Setme C2. Obviously you can see the, the general outline, general characteristic similarities. These both have underfolding stocks, they both have this black sort of crackle paint finish, perforated handguards, similar front sights, similar location for the pistol grips. However, in pretty much all the main, all the real details, they do differ. So I'm going to start with the magazine. Unfortunately I don't have a magazine right now uh, for the C2. Um, however, I can tell you it used a straight 30 round magazine, very much like the Spanish Z series submachine guns. The Sterling, of course, uses a curved 32 round, very nice magazine. The standard Sterling mag will not fit in the C2 because it is too long because the Sterling magazine was designed to be interchangeable with the Sten magazine, which is a little bit longer front to back than it needs to be. Now we'll pull the Sterling apart in a minute when we get to the internals of the C2, but for now I want to start with the stock, because this is the worst part of the C2, so let's get it out of the way first. There is a butt plate back here, which is has a sort of rubber plastic pad to it, um, and it sort of snaps into this lowered position, but uh, minimal, minimal utility. The width of the stock here with these plastic cheek rests, this is too wide, these are not particularly comfortable. Uh, in order to fold the stock, we flip the butt plate up on top like that, and then what you have to do is push this button on the side of the stock right there, and then push in the receiver end cap. This is a little funky to do. We're going to push that. And then we can fold the stock forward, and if you lift the butt plate up, you can actually use a little hook. That little hook, in fact, locks into the stock there. When you fold the butt plate down, it locks the stock in place. All right, now that we have that out of the way, we can look at uh, some of the better features of the gun. We have a three position selector switch here. Uh, S is seguro, T is tiro, or uh, single shot, semi-auto, and R is rafaga, or uh, full auto. We have a pretty simple marking on top of the magazine well. Note that the magazine well is canted slightly forward, just like the sterling that helps line up, that, that gives cartridges a little bit of a, a direction towards the chamber helps with feeding. Uh, magazine release is this button right here. The charging handle has been moved to the top of the gun, and it's got this interesting thing, which is pretty cool. This is the first of a, a bunch of clever safety mechanisms that we're going to take a look at here. So the idea of this is, let me start by opening the bolt. Now if we look into the top of the receiver, when I push this button down, as long as the charging handle's forward, it pops this lug down into the receiver. When I go to use the charging handle, when I lift the handle here, you can see that it is going to hit this little lever, and it's going to pop that right back out. So what this does is it locks the bolt in the forward position. If we have the bolt forward like this, but not locked in place, it's possible if you drop the gun on its buttstock for the bolt, the, the, the inertia, to cause the bolt to cycle back just far enough to pick up a cartridge out of the magazine, but not engage with the sear. The bolt will then immediately punch forward again, and being an open bolt firing gun, it will immediately fire the cartridge as soon as it gets into the chamber. Um, and if you're not intending to shoot the gun, that has some very serious potential safety 
problems. Uh, guns like the Sten um, and the early Uzi without its ratchet system were kind of infamous for having this problem. Well, what they did with the C2, they did a couple things to it, actually. Um, the first thing is this bolt lock. So when that's snapped in position, this lug holds the bolt forward to prevent that from happening. And you never have to manually release this, because any time you go to open up the charging handle to cycle the bolt, it automatically unlocks it. Now the next cool little safety feature is that little wedge right there inside the receiver. When I pull the trigger, that wedge drops. However, should the gun manage to fire somehow, or should the bolt manage to come back, say you didn't have the bolt lock engaged, uh, if you're not pulling the trigger, that little wedge is going to intercept the bolt and prevent it from going far enough forward to actually fire a cartridge. So I'm going to pull the trigger here to release the bolt. But let's say I didn't have the bolt lock in place, and I managed to slam this on the ground hard enough to pull the bolt back this far. You see, it's far enough to pick up a cartridge. However, that little wedge is going to slide into the front of the bolt there, and it's going to hit the end of the little slot right there, and it's going to hold the bolt in this position. Right like that. Which means you don't have that once again you avoid the potential for an accidental firing. We're going to take a quick interlude before disassembly to look at the sights. We have a two position sight, we have a 50 yard uh, V notch, you can see there, and a 100 yard aperture sight. Those go together with this square front post with that uh, sort of sheet metal rounded uh, guard around it. Now disassembly, this is very much like the Sterling. Uh, what you have to do is push this button in, and then you push the end cap in and rotate it. There we go, and then the end cap comes off. There is a rubber buffer in here to uh, cushion the final impact of the bolt. First recoil spring. Second recoil spring with an extra bolt weight. This is something similar to the Sterling, so when this is all together it's set up like that. And then the bolt itself. There's your sear surface. There's the little track that the, uh, the safety, the little safety wedge in the front of the gun uh, rides in. We've got our extractor. Interestingly we do not have a fixed firing pin. Instead that is activated by this lever, and it is spring-loaded, and that is there to prevent yet another type of potential accident, namely the potential of a cartridge on a fixed firing pin uh, detonating when it gets pushed onto the breech face before it actually goes into the chamber. With fixed firing pin guns that occasionally happens, and as long as the round isn't contained within the chamber, it generally speaking doesn't have enough energy to, to or doesn't have enough, uh, doesn't build up enough pressure to really be dangerous, to be seriously dangerous, but it does shatter the brass cartridge case and send some shrapnel flying. So avoiding that is a good thing. And that's what this system does. The idea here is when the bolt fully closes, this little lever hits the ejector inside the receiver. That guy right there down inside hits this lever, and that causes the firing pin to come forward. That only happens when the bolt is all the way forward, uh, and so it, it remains an open bolt firing gun. It's just one that doesn't have a fixed firing pin. If we compare this overall mechanical setup uh, to the Sterling, so Sterling down here, set me C2 up here. There are a number of differences, so we're pretty well familiar with this one. The Sterling has a bolt handle that reciprocates, uh, that is fixed to the bolt, and actually used to hold the bolt and its internal weight together. The Sterling does not have this rubber buffer. Uh, Sterling guns do occasionally have buffer pads on the inside, or at least the suppressed ones do. Um, however, the Sterling actually has, it's a little difficult, I can't really show you it working, but there is, you can see that center peg, that is actually spring-loaded. And so this sits on top of it, and this whole thing can compress together, and that acts as the buffer 
uh, on the last bit of travel. So similar result, different system to get there. The Sterling does have a fixed firing pin to it. Uh, diameter of these two bolts is just slightly different. There's no way they can interchange, aside from all the other reasons uh, that they wouldn't be able to interchange. Overall, a really nicely designed gun. Um, I didn't mention the grip before. Uh, it is of course a little bit different than the standard Sterling grip. I don't know that I would call it a major improvement. Um, they're both quite good. The original Sterling grip was quite comfortable as well. Uh, these guns were manufactured in both 9mm Parabellum and 9mm Largo. Uh, typically the Largo would be for uh, internal Spanish uh, security forces use. 9 Parabellum is more popular for the export market. Um, yeah, overall a very cleverly well-designed gun. It's, it's too bad it's let down a bit by the stock, but beyond that definitely something uh, underappreciated. As the name implies, these were developed in the mid-1960s by SETMI, the Spanish government-owned arms production facility. Uh, and it appears by the 1980s at least they were being used, at least to some extent, to replace uh, the earlier Star submachine guns, the Z62-63 and the Z70 series guns, uh, in police and maybe also in military service. I'm a little hazy as to the details of exactly which applications did see replacement and to what extent, uh, but these did find their way into military service. So um, a very cool example of a very rare submachine gun here in the United States. If you like this sort of thing, uh, make sure to check out Morphe's auction catalogs. They always have a whole bunch of very interesting uh, Class 3 machine guns, uh, as well as a wide variety of other firearms. Thanks for watching.